Can I get everybody to bring it in? We're going to get started. Can you guys hear me? Yes, no? Louder? I'm probably louder without this than I am with this, but OK. Uh, and I reserve the right to do that. So uh, it's on or it's not on? Yes, it's on. It's on? All right. At least I've got everyone's attention, even if it's just to tell me about the bad audio quality. But uh, <laughs> welcome. Uh, I'm Bob Schwartz. I'm part of uh, Capgemini. Um, we're excited to have you here tonight. Uh, let me just do a minute or two of introduction, and we're going to get to our program, because I know that's uh, what everybody's interested in. But uh, I also love the, the networking that we've had going on. It's good just for me um, to see Honestly, I, I think I see some familiar faces that I feel like I see you guys all the time, like you're feeling too welcome. Um, and then there's some of you that have been here before, which is great. And then a lot of new faces, which is also really great. So um, we're glad to have you here. Um, what I wanted to do, uh, I know this is a little cliche, but just by a show of hands, who's been to one of our What's Nows in New York before? OK, so I, that also by uh, omission, uh, there's a few of you that I just want to talk to. So welcome. Glad you're here for the first time. Those of you that have heard me say this already, I'm sorry. Uh, but let me just give you a couple uh, couple words real quick. Uh, Cap Gemini, those of you who don't know us, um, come find me. Come find some of my colleagues tonight, and let's uh, let's start that networking. But I work in uh, a part of Cap Gemini that we call the Applied Innovation Exchange. That's part of this space. This is basically two floors in New York. Um, in Capgemini, where we focus on helping our clients innovate. We're a big global systems integrator. We work on you know, IT problems, consulting, things like that with, uh, with our clients, which tend to be large global household names that, that most of you would know. Um, so in doing that, the, we, the, the group that I'm part of, this Applied Innovation Exchange, let's just underline that exchange part. This is part of that. It's part of building those networks and figuring out how to be connected, how to help our clients connect, how to connect ourselves to the best ideas, forward thinking, things like that. And that's why we try to do these sessions, to kind of hear what are the fresh ideas, what's on people's minds, engage, interact. So I really ask you to pay attention, interact, let it hang out, appreciate you being here. Um, if you've got questions about Capgemini, I'd love to talk to you about that. If you've got questions about how to help you or, or firms that you work with apply innovation, that's another discussion that we want to have. That's a discussion that I want to have. Um, and with that, I guess I'll, uh, I'll turn it over. Pete, you're going to moderate for us tonight. I'll let you introduce everything. We're looking forward to hearing from John. So thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Uh, we're really glad to have you here. And uh, please, don't hesitate to, to look me up afterwards. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks to Bob and Cap Gemini. Um, who've really been responsible for this series. And this series has roots for those who don't know and haven't been here before. This is our 38th What's Now? And it started on the West Coast, started in San Francisco. It's been going for several years. We have now just started our second year here in New York uh, after finishing last year of uh, every month actually having a, a, a gathering here. Uh, and this is our biggest crowd so far coming out to see John. It's jammed. It's great to see all the folks here. Um, We've accomplished a lot, actually, out here for the last year, but also over the course of this series. Um, we really have been able to explore a lot of the key little issues around innovation in both these hubs, these really the hubs of unbelievable innovation on both coasts here. We've also been able to um, build out, really get A-list folks talking, uh, at, at the highest caliber folks actually bring in talking to us here. We've been able to bring together an incredible network, the invite-only invites that we do here, of folks like yourself. Uh, it's been a really an interesting accomplishment, and it is, uh, could we just, yeah, we just got to yeah, be quieter. Um, we're basically, uh, it's, it's an incredible accomplishment we've done this year. Now, one of the high bars of this series is basically that um, the person that presents or talks in an interview with, with me is actually wrestling with their latest thinking their new idea, questions that they don't really know all the answers to. There's other event series you can go to to actually get, you know, the can talk, the TED talk thing that's polished, the thing that everyone's running the circuit on the conferences. This isn't that. This is always trying to focus on what is the latest thinking. What is really the thing that's really this person's wrestling with? And for today, we have got the, the highest bar. I thought, oops, sorry, the, but one of the high bars here and what's going on here. Um, John Battelle, oops, we got a little bit of feedback here. Are we good? John Battelle, can we get that off? This is not good here, <laughs> folks. 
Um, as soon as I said John Battelle, all of a sudden it went up. Oh, there, you go. there you go. I can say that. Um, all right, here. I'm doing a good. I can speak loudly here. Oh, is that what's happening? Okay, well, that's fine. Speaking now. Is everyone good there? All right, we got a little feedback stop. Okay. Um, we have got the high bar with John Battelle. John has been wrestling. This is the first time he's ever presented this material. This is a, a talk that literally at midnight last night, we were on the phone with designers in San Francisco working out these slides. He's been noodling on it all, more, all day here, too. So this is the freshest you can get his take on what's going on here. Uh, and a very high bar and a very complex issue of really what do we do to really fundamentally rethink the data ecosystem, essentially, of the that's running on top of the economy. And it has effects on all kinds of things, including the advertising system and other things, which we'll discuss. Now, John and I, actually, we go back a long time. I've known him for about 25 years. And one of the things I love about John is he is both an intellectual and an entrepreneur. He's both. And that's actually a rare thing. Uh, he's got bona fides um, in the entrepreneur world. He's literally uh, founded and run uh, six different companies from the early Wired magazine, where I first got to know him. He hired me, in fact, as the managing editor there. And in fact, then he left to start another company, fit, um, uh, industry standard, and I ended up having to be take over as managing editor, so we had an early handoff. But they went from, from then he's gone through six of these. His latest company is Nuco, or was Nuco, and now he's moving on to, I think, a seventh, which he might even talk about here. So entrepreneur cre street cred, totally down. But the thing about it is he's an intellectual about this, too. He thinks deeply about the entire ecosystem, way beyond what his company or his little industry is doing, and he thinks about what it all means. And he's been, uh, he's been a writer through all this. He's written books. He's constantly working out his thinking and writing. If you don't follow John, you should. Uh, he's actually been wrestling with these ideas, in fact, for the last six months, uh, following on blogs and all kinds of different posts he works on. Um, so he's actually got the twofer. And because of that, he's become an extremely valuable person in the kind of tech infra info infrastructure, I sense you could say. And so, for example, last spring, he was testifying before the Senate to help educate the U.S. government and the senators about what we should be doing about Facebook and the giant tech companies. Uh, he's also now picking up a new, a new world here. He's actually in uh, Columbia now, rooted in Columbia, and he's actually wrestling with policy and technology policy and actually working in the whole academic world. He's a guy that really does bridge a lot, bridge a lot of different spaces, and so we're extremely lucky to have him here today. Now, so what he's going to do, since it is so fresh and new, he's going to present for uh, a while here, just to kind of lay out his big ideas with some slides and some thoughts at an actual lectern here, just like his academic new kind of space has got him going. Uh, and then I'm going to come up and we're going to have a little conversation to start with him, but the, a lot of the night is going to also be interacting with you folks, because we have attracted a really amazing group of folks that know a lot about data, marketing, advertising, and all else, and uh, John really welcomes it, and as we do, the kind of feedback and the interaction and the broader conversation. So with that, let's, uh, let's get John up and start Tell us what to go. All right, all right, all right. Yay! I'm, uh, I'm supposed to stand here, so this is now a test. First of all, when you move to New York, uh, uh, you know who your friends are when they come here. Uh, and man, you guys are here. Thank you. Uh, I'm like, uh, it's really, you know, it's humbling. Thank you. It, it, I, it's awesome. I've worked with so many people that are here. I am terrified at the moment. Uh, uh, this is a 3,300 word essay. Um, I think out loud by writing. Um, uh, I am now going to attempt the first ever piece of performance art on this writing. Um, I had a lectern because I'm sure once I get to you know maybe number two, three, and four of this particular talk, I won't need notes. But you're getting the raw shit here, guys. Like this is the first. Okay, I've been thinking about this stuff for a very, very long time. In 2007, I wrote a post called "The Data Bill of Rights." 2007. Um, so uh, that, uh, and I reread it in, in preparing for this. So I'm here like as an explorer. I first of all want to thank Cap Gemini. Um, I run a lot of media businesses. People, you know, may forget, but none of this happens without your underwriter sponsor. So Cap Gemini has the vision to make that happen. Thank you, and Pete, who I've enjoyed working with for 25 years, and everybody here. Um, my new uh, one, one of my new bosses, uh, Merritt Jano, is here. The dean uh, of the school. Of, uh, of international uh, public affairs, 
um, and my partner, Mark Hansen, on uh, a project I'm now going to talk about. This is what I'm doing. So all you guys out there that have been asking me, what the hell are you doing? This. And I've never done this before. This is the first time. So if I bomb here in New York, I might have to go back to Marin. Um, uh, but my wife and my daughter are here, and they won't let me do that, because they like it here. Um, OK, Pete features experts at these events. I am not an expert, really, in the things I want to talk about. I'm an expert at asking questions of the things I want to talk about. Um, uh, and you know, some context, since 1986, literally, I've chased one story, just one story, the impact of technology on society. When I saw in 84 as a, uh, gosh, I think it was a freshman uh, at Berkeley, I saw the Mac. And I'm like, oh, this is going to change everything. And I was on that story forever. I covered Apple when I graduated. Um, then I thought, no one can understand anything I'm saying. So, I, so we started this crazy magazine called Wired. And when, when you do something you know, and it works, it's kind of like a musical act that's been like, in the garage for a long time. And then the first album goes big. So the first album actually hit. We, like, it, it happened, which was cool. And then the, pro the thing about Wired was we paid attention to the broad story, any story, where technology impacted society. Our job was to imagine what would happen if it happened, because it hadn't really happened yet. It was 92, OK, 93. And then write about it as if it had happened. That was our job. Um, Kevin Kelly used to say, you know, our job is to go over the horizon of the future and bring back fresh meat. Um, so. <laughs> Then, I, then it started to really actually happen to business, so I started a new, uh, a, a new uh, company and publication and website and so on called The Industry Standard. And this was really focused on business. And then I started realizing that the actual model of what I cared about, which was media, was changing dramatically. So um, I started this thing called Federated Media, and some people who worked at Federated are here. Um, and the idea there was simply that media was changing you know, uh, completely. Uh, and that we were having a conversation now with the audience as publishers. We can no longer sit up in the ivory tower, but we needed to actually engage. Right? I called this conversational media. That didn't quite pan out. It became social media. I like conversational better, <laughs> but it doesn't go as viral. So what are you going to do? Um, Federated Media was also a technology platform, and a company spun out of that called Sovereign. Now, Sovereign does 9 billion ad calls a day, and I'm the chairman of it. It's all programmatic. I think the programmatic ad business is broken, okay? And we can talk about that. Um, but I think what Sovereign does is to try to unbreak it. But that's a little background on me. Nuco, the last company that I started, noticed that there were so many companies starting, but how do you pick the best ones? How do you pick the ones that are actually trying to change the world in a positive way? What got me a little bit down after a few years of doing Nuco was that there weren't that many that I, th that there weren't as many companies as I thought they were. What was going on in the innovation economy? Something seemed broken. Something seemed like, given all the things that could be done, why weren't they being done? So I got interested in that. So let's get to the talk. Oh, that's awesome. The talk's called It's Broke. Let's fix it, okay? I moved to New York four months ago. Um, I, I, you know, you guys are very welcoming. This whole thing about New York is not true. New York, New York is awesome. And we moved for the conversation because the conversation had become, what's the word I wrote down, cloistered in the valley. Uh, the valley is a company town. And it's not that the company, the industry is, is tech. It's that it's a town that only talks about companies. It literally talks about companies all the time. If you have an idea, and you want to talk about that idea with someone, you can't get five minutes into a conversation before it's like, how do we turn that into a company? Oh, I know a company that's already doing that. I want to finance that company. <laughs> I want to talk about more than companies. But I love companies, OK? Love them. Starting another one, for God's sake. But this huge story that I've been on, tech meeting society, is coming to this really important inflection point right now. 25 years ago, you know, the wildest dreams that we came up with at Wired they happened. I have almost a full set of Wired in, in our library, in our study. And, and, and you pull any one of them, and you're like, well, yeah, that happened. That happened. Not exactly that way, but it happened. So we predicted the technology was going to change everything, and then it did. But what we didn't realize was we weren't going to like all of it, right? We didn't realize that it wasn't going to be super awesome, which is like what we thought at Wired. Everything's going to be super awesome. 
That's what we thought. The externalities of technology's grip on society were starting to show through in the last few years, right? I think two years ago, it got super real, okay? I don't really care what your political point of view is. A lot of my friends are here, so I know at least I have some support when I say I think history will judge the last election as the equivalent of the Black Sox scandal. It was stolen. And it wasn't stolen by any one person. One person did win. But it was, it was stolen by a lack of attention to the impact of technology on society. So, so let's start with some context. My current work, which I promise we're going to talk about a little bit, split between two projects. Okay? One has to do with data governance. So I know you're all going to Twitter right now to tweet that, because that's super viral, data governance. <laughs> right. The other is political media. How they connected, I hope by the end of this talk I can somehow prove that they are. As I said, I've never publicly spoken about this. I'm nervous. My family is staring at me right now. There's a guy I edited 25 years ago right over there. My boss over there. I hope I don't bomb. You know what they say about New York, so let's go. Thank you. <laughs> Data. That's a cliche image on purpose. I mean, how much have you guys thought about data in the last two years? Like, all the time. Data, 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 big data, data breaches, data advertising, trust, you are the product because of data. Data, 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 data. OK, we talked about data a lot. That's the SEC. Governance. How much have you talked about governance or thought about governance? You probably thought about government a lot, right? <laughs> government is on everybody's mind, right? But governance, maybe, maybe not, right? How often have you put these two words together? Data, governance. Probably not so much. But I think it's time to change that. Because I think we have slouched our way into an architecture of data governance that's broken. One that severely retards economic and cultural innovation. One that harms society as a whole. So I want to unpack and define these terms. Governance is an architecture of control, right? I'm sort of a little inspired by Larry Lessig here, but it's a regulatory framework that manages how a system works, any system, biological system. But we think about it a lot as government, a political system. We think about it in terms of corporate governance, which is something I'm super interested in and that we'll be talking about. Let's talk about corporate governance. Here is a definition, a definition, the system of rules, practices, and processes by which a firm is directed and controlled. Investopedia, it must be true. Um, but in my work, when I refer to governance, it's not just a system of rules, practices, and processes by which a firm controls itself, but by which a firm controls the ecosystem that it is part of, OK? The developers, the partners, the impacted communities. Now, what is data, OK? I think of data as unrefined information. I'm, I almost said like pre-processed information, but that made me think of like milk and cheese. Um, I, this is the first time, guys, okay? This is going to get better. But um, <laughs> data has many attributes, but it's the core commodity from which information is created, right? I think it's inarguable that the difference between data and information, it's not Socrates, but that is Socrates, is human meaning, okay? In other words, information is data that means something, that makes a difference, okay? And it's possible that information is the fourth law of thermodynamics, because there are only three, but many physicists have posited it, that the difference between information and entropy is the fourth law. That's the second law, entropy. Information turns things that dissipate into, into basic noise into something that means something. That's what information is. Okay, but I don't want to go down a rabbit hole of physics. There's so many rabbit holes in this talk, so many. Um, as we learned in the, the hard way, look, can I go back, because I just screwed up. I hit this button there. Oh, but I have to do that again. OK, perfect. Um, over the past decade, there have been a few very large companies which have purview over a massive catalog of meaningful data, data that is meaningful to each of us individually and data that is meaningful to society at large. And we're in the midst of a grand data renaissance, like a whole explosion of potential in this data. That's why we're data, 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 data. Right? We, we love our data. But I hope this renaissance will give rise, that's John Locke, to an enlightenment. I think we're pre-enlightenment right now. If history rhymes, 
we had a renaissance, then we had an enlightenment. We had a data renaissance, we need an information enlightenment, okay? So let's talk about the enlightenment for a second. Why not? That was a great leap forward. It's generally almost universally recognized as a, one of the most important sort of periods in human history where we kind of got our shit together and we discovered the central tenet of the Enlightenment, which I know I'm becoming professorial here, but anyone have a guess what the central tenet of the Enlightenment is? Okay, we're gonna go there. <laughs> well, wait a minute, let me start with the central document of the Enlightenment. Many would agree if they are United States patriots is the US Constitution. Why? Well, it's this universal declaration of the rights of mankind that built on Locke and Hume and the French and the British and stole from everybody, but basically this was a universal declaration of mankind. Hopefully we'll get to humankind pretty soon, right? Um, uh, and our current political situation, our current political, our de democratic uh, 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 system is based on this living document, right? The cornerstone of enlightenment thinking, now I'm getting to what I screwed up before, is, that's Aristotle, the scientific method, all right? So what is the scientific method, right? Considered thesis formation, rigorous observation, comprehensive data collection, right? Healthy skepticism and complete transparency and sharing of the data so others can make it better, challenge it, question it, dispute it, right? Sharing, sharing, very important, data. The whole thing turns on the data. So that begs a question, who has the most and the best data in our society right now? They do. They have the most and some of the best. And we are finally asking ourselves this question and the answer is sounding some alarms. As we know, we're in this renaissance, this deluge, this sort of orgy of data creation. We have built these amazing digital sensing organs to discover and create new forms of data, right? We've built these things, and it turns out that the people who built them own them and got the data, right? These, these new digital sensing organs that turned the sort of, I, I often ca call data like frozen in glaciers, and it's been warmed and turned into a new state where we can access it. Before we didn't know, now we do, right? So the technology companies have initially taken ownership of this emerging resource, and we are just starting to figure out as a society, huh, what's all about? And we're asking this important question now, at least I hope we are, who's governing this data, right? And in the United States, the truth is, we don't have a clear answer to that question. We haven't really talked about it. it strikes me as a big nuts, right? Now, they've talked about it in the EU, and they've come up with something called GDPR, and we can talk about that afterwards. I have some strong opinions. But we can intuit an answer of who is governing them in the place of no one else governing them, and that is the large tech companies, and I have a corollary. That is every new co. Every new company that is involved with data. What did they do? What did I do when I started Federated or Nuco? Well, I need a data policy. I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna look at apples and steal it. Everybody's using the same data policy as the ones that were written by the lawyers at the big companies, because if it works for them, maybe I can get VC funding, right? Sure. This has created a phenomenon in our society that I've come to call a default internet constitution. Okay, see how I, we the internet people? <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna keep that one, but you know, anyways, that was one of those midnight ads. Um, <clears throat> so without really thinking critically about it, the technology and the finance industries have delivered us this new constitution, a fundamental governance document controlling how information flows through the internet. It was never ratified never debated publicly, never published with the flourish of a pen. It's damn hard to read. But it is based on a discoverable corpus. And that corpus is terms of service and end user license agreements. It's there. That's the governance model for the US internet and the data which flows around it. Terms of service, we actively ignore them. There was research done, and this was four years ago, so it's probably worse now. But this research said, that the average United States citizen encounters so many of these and ignores so many of them that if they were to actually read them and pay attention to them and understand them, it would take 76 working days in a year, okay? So we ignore them, but ignore 
you know, ignoring begets ignorance. We've ignored it at our peril. No one understands them. We should, though, because we're going to make change. If we're going to change the way the architecture of control works on, in our society on the internet. We need to change the terms of service dramatically. Let's be clear, these terms of service have hemmed data into silos, okay? They're built by lawyers who listen to engineers. What do engineers want? Everything. Have you ever worked with them? They want access to everything. They want to know everything so they can build the coolest product in the world. That's what they want to do. And God bless them when they get it right. But they don't think hard about the externalities of that. And the lawyers say, well, I'm going to protect everything because that's my business, right? What is the business model of a data-driven business? It's engagement. It's intention. It is more often than not advertising. And don't tell me Apple is not driven by advertising because I'm sorry, a black slate of glass with nothing on it, I'm not paying a thousand bucks for that, okay? Apple's part of the problem. So let's take a look at a rough map of what this terms of service architecture looks like. I have spent hours on this. That is my whiteboard. <laughs> this is the mainframe architecture. Any of you who you know, sort of hung out as long as I have in this business, remember the mainframe architecture. Remember, there's a big ass computer in the sky called the mainframe. That's the super expensive thing. It has all the power, all the control, all the data process, all the applications run on it. All the value exchange happens there. Down here, dumb terminals. What happens with dumb terminals? Data goes up, and a program running up here goes back, usually to pull more data up, right? That's the mainframe architecture. My hypothesis is that's the architecture of our current internet. Does this look like Facebook to you? Looks like it to me. But for a brief shining moment, it wasn't that way. Right? There used to be this architecture, and it's still there under the surface. I call it the 1.0 internet architecture. Early believers in that, and I see a few pointing at you, Paul. Um, remember this world, 94 to 2012, the open internet era. The internet ran on a different architecture. It ran on this idea that intelligence should be pushed out as far to the nodes as possible. Now, we couldn't because the technology sucked. Get the, get, the tech, get the intelligence all the way out to each person, but we could damn well get it to the site, to the website, right? And the website was where the intelligence happened. The website was where the control was. The website where the data was. And websites started to share data with each other in this kind of crazy, chaotic, non-governed, sort of governed by the crowd way. And we, sort of Web2 you know, evangelists, of which I was certainly one, I had a business called Web2, um, we believed that it was just going to happen, that this was just going to keep going unimpeded. We would solve the technology problems. We would get there eventually. We would build what we knew was going to be possible, right? Even if the tech wasn't quite there, but the platforms got there first. And damn, they were so good, and they were so fun to be on, right? That we kind of let that other vision start to fade, and the new architecture start to take over, right? But we can still learn from Internet One and imagine a scenario, right? Imagine a scenario where this technology and this approach is as it works with as cool as the way we know the internet works now with the phones and the apps and the computers in the sky, right? So if we can imagine a new world based on this kind of a distributed architecture, what would it look like? That's the question informing my work. So finally, here we go. What's my work? I'm going to drive down a road and go skiing, um, obviously. Um, a new architecture. We're stuck in this architecture that limits the potential of data flow in our society. We have to envision a world where it is, in fact, flowing. And those of us old enough to remember those heady 1.0 web days, we would assume it was going to come. But as Tim Wu, who's also at Columbia, has pointed out, Almost always, media and technologies tends to consolidate around a few winners, and they have their hand on the master switch. And as a culture, particularly our US capital culture, tends to give 
society a curse of bigness. We, we, we tend to bigify our companies, right? But if we're going to change that system, there's going to be a lot of losers and a lot more winners. But we have to imagine what that change might look like. And I've given it a lot of thought. And I think it's basically this phrase, let the data flow. OK? So I want to give you a couple scenarios. And stay with me here. They sound a little crazy. How many of you guys use Amazon? Come on, be honest. Yes, everybody. OK, great. Imagine you're just home one night. Your phone's on the counter. Ping, something comes up. It's like a notification from Walmart. And you have never stepped foot in a Walmart. You've never gone to walmart.com. But it's a notification from Walmart that says, I think we can save you $1,700. You're like, OK, prove that. So you look at it. And they say, all we want you to do is go get your token from Amazon of all your past purchase histories, when, how much, what, what you looked at and didn't buy, everything Amazon knows about you, all that data that you co-created with them. I have done this. I have downloaded my data from Amazon. It comes as an Excel spreadsheet. It's not very useful. It's there. Walmart says, we just want it from you. Give it to this third-party broker, this trusted DocuSign kind of situation that springs up because the ecosystem supports it. They'll keep it. It'll be safe. It's been trust marked by various government approved bodies or whatever. You're cool with that. You know that's cool. You give it to Walmart. And as soon as you give it to them, within the speed of a Google search, they come back and say, we can save you seven times. If you had bought everything you bought at Amazon on Walmart.com last year, you could have saved $758. Here's our deal. You swap to using it Walmart.com, we'll give you a $1,758 credit. And we'll give you a concierge to help you do it. Sounds great. It's fucking impossible. There's no way that would ever happen. <laughs> Here's another one, OK? How many of you ever dreamt of just opening a little cafe or a restaurant, right? I mean, or you know, the crazy people, OK? All of you crazy people. I, I, I've, ever since forever, I've wanted to open a restaurant. But I started magazine, so you know, same failure rate. Um, <laughs> so the reasons they fail is people don't know what the hell they're doing. They're like, I love Italian. There's not an Italian place within three blocks of where I live, so I'm going to start one. Not the best business plan, but imagine if you could do this. Imagine if you could put out an RFP on a, on a research platform right? that someone you know, recommended to you, and you say, I want, the, I want 1,000 people within a mile of where I'm going to put this restaurant to give me all your Uber data, all your Resi data, all your open table data, all your Yelp data, all your Google searches, anything that might help me understand the world of data that is already draped around this neighborhood that is just unrefined information. You guys help me turn that into information. I am now going to become an information processor. Now I understand that people don't want Vietnamese and they don't want Italian, but they might be interested in a nice bistro. right? And now I can take that data report, snazz it up with some of my you know, awesome keynote skills, and get a bank loan. Because the bank's like, yeah, actually, that data works pretty well. I took that token you gave me about the data you got, and I ran it through my little token thing. You know, there's a, there's a higher chance than normal this might work. What happens? Cultural innovation, a new place on the block that is actually possibly going to work, right? And economic innovation. Can you imagine the number of small businesses that would be better because of this kind of access to data that is currently siloed in millions of apps, right? It's an entire new economy, and it's totally impossible right now. Totally impossible. We're at an inflection point in the conversation we're having in this country about what we're going to do about data. Right? Right now, 2019 is the year of data regulation. Okay? I don't think any regulation is actually going to pass. If any of you have ever read my, my, my uh, uh, predictions, I predicted that there won't actually be anything passed this year, except possibly the Honest Ads Act. Right? Which everyone can agree, well, we should have some transparency on ads because elections. Right? Um, okay, fine. But there isn't a, uh, a, a committee chair in Congress who doesn't want to put a tech CEO in front of a hot seat and yell at them this year. It's going to happen a lot. It happened a lot last year. It's going to happen a lot more this year because the Democrats are in charge. And the Republicans kind of agree with them, at least on the privacy stuff. We can go down that rabbit hole during Q&A. Okay? Um, <clears throat> the one thing that is coming up in terms of what is the regulatory relief that maybe we should do this year or cons consider or really talk about Antitrust. You know, if the curse of bigness has now infected our you know, top firms in tech, maybe we need to break them up. I'm not necessarily against that, but that doesn't address the core architectural issue that I'm trying to bring up here. 
I have a crazy idea. It's improbable, it will probably never happen, but it's pretty elegant. I'm calling it the Token Act. No, this is not an ICO, okay? <laughs> Jesus. I just realized, Jesus, what did you even call it that for? Okay. It's not an ICO. It, it is not a Bitcoin crazy thing. It's, remember that token I talked about, that Amazon token, right? The Token Act is simply this. It requires one thing. You can describe it in one sentence. Every data processing service at scale, and we can argue about what scale is, a million people using it, 10 million people using it, I don't know. A anyone at scale must deliver back to its customers any co-created data in machine readable and portable format, easily ported to any other data service. That's it. That's it. Don't need any trust. That's going to scare the crap out of Apple, out of Amazon, out of Google. They have, who are the top lobbyists in Washington now? It's the same people who are the top companies in the United States. The most money is being spent by these guys. They will lobby that, and this is never going to make it. I know a couple of Congress people, a couple of senators. I doubt this is ever going to go anywhere. It's just a crazy idea, okay? But I think it's a pretty good one because imagine the value unlocked if all of a sudden data can flow laterally as opposed to in that mainframe architecture. If people can ask questions and maybe pay five or 10 or 15 bucks to get answers for them of this rich data that we're co-creating with all of these services. And the big guys would say, this will destroy my business. And I would say to them, there's no reason that a data token can't have a VIG. There's no reason that if I take my data token from Amazon and give it to Walmart, it doesn't come with a 7% VIG for every purchase. It goes back to Amazon for co-creating that data. And the market will determine what the right price is for that VIG. Right? And if I'm not a restaurant entrepreneur, I'm going to pay $50 for every one of those tokens that you might give me. Right? That's $50,000 I'd pay to make sure I don't lose $500,000 three years in a row before I finally go bankrupt. I think the market for this could be exponentially larger than our current business. And I think there's a huge opportunity for large companies. It forces people to compete above the level of data hoarding, beyond the tending of miniature walled gardens, which is what most apps are, or massive walled agribusinesses, which is what Facebook and Google are, and Amazon, right? And in fact, point of fact, ADM and Monsanto are in fact massive walled agribusinesses. They're actually walled agribusinesses, but that's another chapter. Firms would have to compete on creating more valuable tokens, on enabling each of us to become refiners of information. Us, the bit flips, the, intelligent, the intelligence gets pushed to the node. That would be, Amazing. But this is just a crazy idea. This is an exercise in envisioning a society that is governed by a different kind of data architecture. We need more ideas like this, not less. And in order to have them, we have to understand how we're governed now. We cannot imagine change without understanding where we're standing right now. And that's the work I'm doing at Columbia with some very smart grad students, one of which is in the room. Hi, Matt. Um, and, it's being, and I'm calling it for lack of a better, sexier, viral name, um, mapping data flows. There you go. <laughs> I can do better. Yes, thank you, Michael. Uh, you said that to me for 25 years. That's what you said to me. Ah. <laughs> so mapping data flows is simply this. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take every single discrete term in every single term of service and the end user license agreement of the top four firms in technology and turn it into a database. And then we are going to visualize that database and ask it questions. And we are going to create a visualization of, here's what you can do, here's what you can't do, here's what we don't know, here's what we wish we knew. Here's Amazon compared to Google on this issue. Here's Facebook compared to Apple on that issue. And it's going to be a living, breathing visualization of the governance that is actually driving our entire economy. And the fact we don't have that Thank you. <laughs> I didn't expect that, but cool. Um, uh, we have a deadline, May. Um, we're, we're a little nervous about it, but I've done visualizations before, and it really comes down to structuring the data process properly, right? And so that's where we're starting, and I'm super excited about it. Um, that's the Columbia project in a nutshell. I will end up writing a 10,000 word piece about it that no one will read, but I'll be very proud of it. Um, so let's. Get to the final. You guys all came like, John's going to talk about advertising, right? Like, OK, let's get there. Um, but wait, there's more. Finally, advertising. OK, I haven't spoken about advertising very much, but 
Here, I'll close with it. I've written at length about advertising for my entire career, for 25 years. Um, the truth is, this problem that I've laid out, advertising is not the cause of this problem. It is an outgrowth of it. If you offer any company the opportunity to find a new customer and acquire that customer for less than it will cost to make money from that customer, they're going to do it. It doesn't matter if it's a limo service or if it's, you know, Procter & Gamble. They're going to do it. That's what business does. Find new customers, make more money. That's what businesses do. It's not advertisers' fault that these platforms were made that worked for them, right? Millions of advertisers use these platforms. Um, the problem is simply this. The people who run technology platforms didn't actually understand the power and the limitation of their systems. And let's be honest, neither do we. Rene de Resta uh, pointed this out. Boy, this thing is giving me some hassles. Rene de Resta pointed this out in recent work around uh, Russian interference in our national dialogue. Any system that allows automated processing of messaging is subject to directed and sophisticated abuse. The place for regulation is not advertising, although the Honest Ad Ads Act, I think, will pass. It's in how the system actually works architecturally. Advertisers, however, have to be highly aware of this transition in architecture that we are in the midst of. Because advertisers and marketers are very used to the way it's been. We've built our entire businesses on it. So we have to prepare for whatever is coming next. We have to actually participate in what's coming next. And ideally, marketers and advertisers lead. That would be cool. That's my wake-up call for anyone involved in marketing or media. And I look forward to talking about that with you. And I think if together, industry, government, consumers, collectively, if we unite to address the core architectural issues, giving at the same time consumers, we should say citizens, economic, creative, and personal agency over the data they co-create with platforms, apps, and technology, the question of toxic assets Toxic advertising will actually disappear faster than it arose. But I've talked long enough. Thank you for coming tonight. I hope I didn't bore you, and I hope we can have a great conversation now. Thanks so much. Could you help me with this? I don't Thank you. Wow. Oh, wow. That was. Uh Heady, and actually, I could. I was watching. There wasn't. You could hear a pin drop in here. Watching it going here. So let's um, let's bring up the chairs, and we get him remarked here. Um, All right. Sorry, uh, I had a little technical difficulty there. Um, and we're gonna get you a chair up here. I'll, I'll give my chair. I do events. Chair. Damn. Um, yeah. All right. Can I get this little thing? Yeah, here you go. There, ooh, there we go. You already hit it right back to here. Um, very stimulating. Very big picture. Um, first time, guys. And okay. pretty damn good for <laughs> first time. You like. like um, thank you. That, uh, thank you. But I think the, to me. I think I'd like to tease out a few things at the end there, and then also I'm really interested because there are a lot of folks here at the end there. I mean. Um, why do you see this year as such an inflection point? Just because there's so much anger and, and kind of angst built up? or And if so, do you think we could make some huge screw-ups here? I mean, oh, yeah. Make, uh, oh, yeah. Well, let's so, just start but, with what, Europe. Yeah, what, what's, yeah OK. <laughs> yeah. So, so what's yeah. the, why? Yeah, we can totally this? screw this up. And I think one of the ways we could screw it up is like, OK, well, Europe's fault has figured this out. They thought about it really hard. And they have. And actually, I think it's well intended. They have an architecture. So the part of the project that I'm working on, when, when I envisioned it, of course, way too big. I had to Occam the hell out of it. I just had to like, no, cut, 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 cut. But the original idea was, let's compare the data architectures of the United States, China, and Europe, right? In detail. <laughs> That's okay. a big thing. But, but, but Europe spent a fair amount of time thinking about this, and they created a regulatory framework, m mainly around sort of privacy, focusing on the individual, and the right to be forgotten, and various other things. But what they ended up doing was um, forgetting about innovation, in my opinion. 
Um, it, it, is, it is a regulatory burden uh, on, on startups and, and other companies that, that I think it's very easy for large companies to manage this new regulatory burden. I mean, they don't like having to pay tens of millions of dollars to consulting firms to figure out what to do about it, but they have the money to do it. But little companies don't. And so it actually helps uh, uh, codify the architecture of control as opposed to distribute it. Um, so we could make that kind of a mistake. Um, but I think one of the reasons that we have, uh, that this year is such a big year is, first of all, you know, come on. It, 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 the tech industry is just, I'm not going to say what I was about to say. Um, <laughs> uh, this the, is being live streamed, by the way, and it's on video, and it'll actually um, it'll live The tech on industry here. has stepped on it uh, like over and over and over again in the last few years. It just, you, you just, it's just been a constant. I mean, you know, Equifax. If you think Equifax isn't in the tech industry, then you're not paying attention, right? Equifax, like, come on, right? I mean, we all yawn now when Marriott, like, oh, it's only half a, half a billion, you know, uh, people, you know, that, that where there was a data leak. Like, people are starting to wake up to, okay, data seems to be important because, like, they know me. How, why did they even know me, you know? And everyone, everyone, everybody has one of those data protection things that was given to them for free because there was a data breach somewhere. So we basically trained everyone to, like, at least once log into one of these places and go, what the hell is this, right? So everyone's aware. We have this awareness. If I was doing a marketing campaign for data awareness, you know, and I was, like, Machiavellian about it, I'd be like, let's have lots of breaches. <laughs> That's the best way. Now people are, like, aware. Right? What we need to do is make it matter. Right? That Walmart example or that restaurant example or a million more that we could come up with, that makes it matter. Right? I can get something better. You know? and, and I think that that's what we're failing to do. And I think when we're starting Wired, we're like, no one's actually thinking about how cool all this could be. We're all like, oh, breaches, it's awful, privacy, yuck. No, there's super cool stuff we could do with this. This is an incredible resource. This year, I think, first of all, we have a Democratic House, woot woot. Um, and, and, they, and they want to actually talk about, they, first of all, they think the Enlightenment happened. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they, they actually want to talk in a rational and reasonable way about some of these issues. And they're leading the committees in the House, so they're going to have a bunch of hearings and discussions about this that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't taken, I say we, yeah, I voted for them, um, uh, if we hadn't taken the, the House back. So I think that, that helps. And, and, and it's on Pelosi's agenda. Ro Khanna is leading this data bill of rights. It's called the data bill of rights. Um, uh, uh, that's, that's being circulated. There's a bunch of new legislation, so I think it's, it, you know, there's a lot of reasons. So, so we've got this kind of, average people are seeing the impact of their data being breached, but also all the data is there. You're watching anger at the big c concentration of the big tech companies, yeah. so you can see those two things happening. Talk more about what you touched on at the end there about encouraging anyone in the advertising or marketing ecosystem to to not just pay attention, to pay attention. Right. So you're, you're feeling this is the year, big changes are going to come out of yeah. it. Talk a little bit about what kind of potential impacts could happen on people who are rooted in advertising and marketing, which is right. many. And then, you know, what their energy or their, what they could do to actually help yeah. move the ball here, so the way you encourage them. That's a great, that's a great question. Um, I've stayed close to a lot of people in, in marketing. I, I, some of the, like my most, I don't know, my, I, I, I have, like deep fondness for, for many of the people I worked with in, in the space, some of whom are here, and I won't embarrass them, but you know who you are. Like super smart, super interesting, you know, forward-thinking people, you know, uh, handcuffed by quarterly results and CFOs. Um, and and, and when, whenever you have to hit a near-turn number, you're going to turn to the platform that allows you to hit that near-turn number, right? Um, and and, and you, what I have heard from the CMOs and, and, and the you know, heads of marketing that I uh, have worked with closely over the last few years is they are secretly really unhappy with the choices they've had to make. They, they, you know, the, uh, Procter & Gamble pulled off a of YouTube because of the, um, uh, the fact that they, The Guardian or some, one of the uh, b wonderful independent uh, British papers found a couple of their ads next to like ISIS videos. Um, and so they, they literally just said, screw it, we're off, we're off YouTube for a year. What happened? Well, they didn't spend a, a hundred or so million dollars on YouTube. YouTube saw absolutely no revenue decline. Neither did Procter & Gamble. Hmm. That's interesting, right? So what happened there? Well, YouTube has like a million, two million, three million advertisers, right? They, they have a lot of advertisers. If P&G doesn't buy some inventory, you know, the, you know, Joe's limo service will pick it up, 
right? Um, and, and so that's point one. It doesn't hurt uh, uh, YouTube. Point two is P&G didn't lose sales. As a matter of fact, they had a really good year. Um, so that's interesting. There is this sense that I'm doing this because it's kind of like IBM back in the 60s and 70s. You know, no one gets fired for buying IBM. No one gets fired for buying Google, uh, Facebook, and now Amazon. Um, but if we're going to change, we have to change not just how we buy, what we buy, where we buy. We have to change why we buy. And if you think about the brands that have really broken out, that are super interesting in the last you know, decade or so, how many of them were built on media buys, and how many of them were built because they understand data, right? Uh, I will call you out, Marcy, as the CMO of WeWork. I've seen the data s stuff that, you know, it's amazing what WeWork knows, and the insights it gains into how it acquires customers because of that, and the messaging that it does do on those standard platforms is informed by that. Um, so leading by understanding and becoming refiners of data into information as a business creates a virtuous cycle, right? And so I, I think that marketers have to rethink their role in the ecosystem. And they also need to step up and become thought leaders. And I'm seeing this from like Mark Pritchard at P&G, Keith at Unilever, others, who, where they're saying, Mark is regularly at industry meetings saying advertising is going to die soon as we know it. This is the guy who spends the most money on advertising in the United States. So it's, it seems to me that people have figured that out, but we need to spend a little bit more time on the answer of what we do next, and it is not simple. It's not, oh, you know, this other interesting college dropout started a startup that we can just stick the money over here now. You know, it may be that you need to double or triple your innovation budgets if you're a large company and start spending it like a venture capitalist. Start encouraging people to do crazy things. Uh, and learn with them. And that's something that my entire career was based on if it weren't for the marketers willing to do that. Got you. Um, so if we can't really look for leadership, I guess, at the, in the big tech companies, we're not so really... So far, no. It's going to be hard <laughs> from, let's say, our, our current crop of political elected leaders. I know you sat in front of trying to explain basic stuff, and there was a lot of... You know. They were actually smarter than I thought. Okay, I, think, well, that's good. I think their staffers were super embarrassed after the Zuckerberg hearing. My hearing was the one after Zuckerberg. It was the same series of hearings, but it was the same room, same committee, but you know, there was like four cameras instead of 400. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, hey, well, I got four. Um, but, 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 but if we can't, just to finish this question. They were smarter. Maybe everything. if you think we can drive the innovation from there, but I was thinking, is there a third way, you know, is there a way that, I mean, you meant, uh, maybe we'll talk to WeWork here in a minute. But is there a way that the kind of next tier down of tech companies or some kind of different business ecosystem could kind of yeah, I can imagine could one. drive this in a way yeah, that, that yeah. maybe is shy of your token act I mean, but I sort is of, getting I, closer? This is, like, this is so weird. This is the first time I, I, I've worked on this work and now I'm having all these like acid flashbacks to Wired. Like, <laughs> um, but I feel like I'm talking to, it could have been you. Um, uh, you know, like, what's it going to be like when there's a computer in every home, you know? Um, uh, you know what's it going to be like when, um, when you have an, an economy that's fueled by, uh, by, uh, you know, I by, 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 by individual data and collective data and, and, and value that's been uh, appropriately accrued to that information in context. So, uh, you know, let's just go back to this apocryphal Amazon um, token. Um, it's worth X to, to Walmart, but it's also, it's non-rivalrous. It's also worth Y to you know, uh, a, a startup that wants to service the retail industry. And it's worth Z to uh, a consulting firm that wants to acquire new clients and, and wants to do some market research. And it's worth, you know, it's, it's worth a lot. An economy will start to develop where marketers will put out RFPs for information so they can determine how to message and who to message to. I see no reason why once we get into a set of economic behaviors as consumers where we're starting to actually instrument our information because an ecosystem has made it easy for us to do so. It's hard now, okay? But imagine it is easy, as easy to instrument our information as it is to instrument what we wear when we walk out the door. An entire conspiracy of millennia since we walked naked has happened to make it possible for us to determine in five minutes if it's, five minutes if it's me, 15 for you, and a little longer for you. <laughs> 
what we're going to put on so we can signal to society who we are and what we mean, right? Hmm. I did spend a fair amount of time trying to pick a coat tonight. <laughs> um, but why aren't we also manicuring and instrumenting our data? And why aren't we spending five or 15 minutes on that? Well, I'll tell you what, my daughter does. But where does she do it? On a goddamn platform. Instagram or Snapchat, right? It could be, the platform could be the world. The platform could be the economy. It does not have to be a company. And, and, and imagine, we can imagine a world that's distributed. That is what all the blockchain maniacs that are true believers who haven't gone home once you know, Ripple lost 90% of its value, right? Uh, who are still around, those people believe, and I believe with them, that there is an underpinning to an economic possibility that is so exciting you can't stop working on it. Now, I'm not a blockchain like zealot, but I do believe that that architecture is going to be very important in the future of this if we get there. I could love to jive in there, but in fact, I think I'm That's gonna another rabbit hole. I mean, it's all I rabbit holes we tonight. Got, we, all right. we already got, now, so here's the deal. We're gonna turn it over to you folks, and I get, we got Michael here. Let's oh, go right course. there. He my, had his hand my, up fastest, but I will say, here's what I would say. Is, let's see hands when, you know, when you get so moved, but you have to wait for a mic. Uh, we are live streaming this, and we want to I forgot to get, we're live streaming this. Was I swearing? I'm sorry. Could, if you could stand up, <laughs> if you could stand up and just identify yourself, and then ask a question, or, or make a comment, and uh, just stick to one if you can. And then uh, the other thing is, if people are interested in this, uh, the live stream is off our site right now, and uh, the reInvent site, and also that has to be. That'd be so used. meta if people start live streaming it here. Well, no, 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 no. Well, people can actually just. Oh, you mean back tweet there. it out? Yeah, if you, if you want to know where it is, and yeah. if people want to see All it, right. and later it'll live there for a long time. Okay, Michael, identify uh, yourself. Michael Schrag, I'm the fellow whose prose John vivisected yeah. cruelly <laughs> over the years. This is a very. <laughs> but, but can you just say, I mean, seriously, it's like, Michael who, Schrag who are you? What are you doing? You know, boom. Michael Schrag with MIT, and I was one of the people who contributed to Wired when John was the editor, and is a very good editor, and this a, had a lot of really good ideas, and this is one of them. But I, so I, I'm not going to ask you the sponsorship thing. I want to ask you a policy question in this okay. regard. The tokenization issue makes a lot of sense, but there are legal precedents. There's compulsory copyright, mm -hmm. you know, licensing. Mm -hmm. there's, there's fair use. Yep. And you emphasize the critical point of co-creation. Yes. This is stuff that people are generating. So why is it, I just want to ask, why not pass something that's very populist, populist and say, hey, it's your information, so what you're going to do is license it to all of these platforms, and we'll have the markets determine how much of the VIG yeah. you get. Yeah. So I just want to get a sense of how you want to balance the yeah. supply side and the demand side well, in that regard. Well, uh, I, I think it's a great question, um, uh, and uh, I, I am, I'm living in fear of your second one now, because that was... Um, <laughs> um, uh, I'm on the board of a company uh, until recently was called Axiom, uh, and now it's called LiveRamp. Um, and so I got to see the sort of, you know, the sausage getting made for the past six years. Uh, in the case of Axiom, I have to say, though, data brokers have a sort of a bad reputation and, and, and with Equifax for good reason. Um, but these guys really high integrity. Uh, and, and what I realized was that co-creation is very important. Um, by rubbing up against, you know, two sticks rubbing together make fire, right? One stick, you know, rougher to do that. So you need the other service, and this, the, I believe the other service needs incentive to co-create value. So I'm, I'm a fan of, however, not enough of a policy expert to argue definitively, but I'm a fan of everyone getting value. If I go browse around Amazon for 30 minutes, <laughs> flinging data about as I do so, um, Amazon should have a right to that, uh, and so should I. Now, what has happened currently is Amazon has all the rights to it, and I have none, right? So you could go populist, but I would, uh, re I I would urge restraint in that message from a politician, because at the end of the day, you are uh, corralling innovation and limiting what uh, uh, you know, governed capitalism can do. I, I, I am everything with a small cap, small letter at the front. You know, I'm a Republican and a Democrat, but I, well, uh, and, well, and, and, and I'm like, something of a libertarian, but not with a large L. Well, um, maybe we have to break out of those kind of labels for now. Um, okay, we're looking at some questions here, but we, we're over here, and then we'll maybe get to over here. Okay. Uh, Devin Vorsanger, Zahn Innovation Center at City College. Hey. Um, 
the population of City College is 90% first-gen immigrants, first-gen in college, of the family in college. Uh, you talk about this open data economy. How do we enfranchise the people who've been left behind? Yeah. How do we enfranchise my students who uh, are just trying to get a job that'll pay them $60,000 a year, much less working with blockchain and understanding all that and, yeah. and being able to take, become the next Facebook? Yeah, yeah. How do they do that? Um, uh, yeah, much less becoming the next Facebook. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> First of all, I, I, I think that the fair answer is I have absolutely no idea. Um, like, I, I wish I could solve that problem. However, I think one of the things we have to do, 100% have to do, is we have to create a system that doesn't drive all capital to the top of the pyramid, okay? That's what we have in our current architecture of governance in our country, not just data governance, all governance, right? Is we drive capital to uh, fewer and fewer people, more and more capital to fewer and fewer people. We have to rewrite the rules of that. And what I'm suggesting, now this isn't gonna change things for this generation of students necessarily, but we have to rethink the economic system. And, and I really, that's what drives me, is if you can have more of a level playing field for how you interact with any particular service, and you co-create value, which all your students do, now in the present, and we all know, I mean, this is one of the only things that I think the Valley was first and right on, besides um, uh, gay rights, is immigration. Right? Look at those companies. You know, they, they are completely driven by people who weren't born here or are first generation immigration, immigrants. Um, so, we, you know, and, and I think many of these companies have forgotten that in terms of their own sort of ongoing Washington lobbying. But the truth is, um, we have to rethink how the economy works. It's not working right now for most people in this economy, and particularly for, for, the, for the, I mean, Thank God for the City College of New York. Like, you know, it needs more funding, more faculty, more resources. Uh, you know, it's awesome. We're yeah, well, you're, look at, you're hiring. <laughs> look at that, look at that. But, but uh, I'll tell you, if you want a shorthand for who's thinking about this politically, to the question I'm like, I don't know if I can answer that question. It's Andrew Yang, okay? Uh, so uh, Andrew Yang is running for president. No one's heard of him. Uh, I wrote a post about him. So John Patel, Andrew Yang, you'll get the post. Um, and, uh, and he's running on, uh, on, on a basic income uh, uh, platform, which I have some mixed thoughts about, and I've interviewed him on stage uh, about that. Um, but he has thought it through very deeply, um, and he is a great person to follow if you're interested in those issues. Yeah. We've also had Chris Hughes here, who gave a great yeah, Chris talk Hughes on, is on that whole thing here. Actually, literally for, for earlier. Uh, we had a woman here. And, and can I see some hands of other people who might want? I know there's a lot of hands. I just got to see where people are. And, and um, OK, go ahead. Okay, I work for a programmatic uh, media buying agency. I recently read in Wired magazine uh, the author decided to try to sell his own data uh, uh -huh. to some new platforms. One was called uh, so Solid, yep. and the other was Ocean Protocol. Yep. And he you know, got his tokens from Amazon and wherever, and at the end of the day, and this was through blockchain, right. he earned three cents. Three cents. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it ain't zero. What are your uh, thoughts about the future yeah, for that? We, we don't have the ecosystem that would support, like, uh, either. Uh, first of all, the amount of work you have to do right now to get your data and then make value from it, uh, you'd have to be a hero. I sort of liken it to, you know, 2000, 1999, 2000, you want to start a blog, you got to learn HTML to start a blog, you know? Um, and, and, and so right now, it's like only people who are super motivated or, or are bored at Wired and don't have a story idea, um, uh, who, who are going to do the work of, uh, of that. There's not an ecosystem to support that. And this is what I call the bit flip problem. Um, I, I, I actually brought this up at a board meeting at Axiom. I'm like, imagine if we could just get all the consumers to care about their data enough that we could flip the bit and, and all of a sudden the economy lights up, right? But we need the reason. 
And to me, the reason is you have to have an ecosystem of innovation where the reason comes to you. We can't expect consumers to sort of wake up one day and go, oh, now I'm going to start monetizing my personal data. You know, the truth is we'll never do that. The truth is we got to come up with really seductive services that are like awesome, right? In, in, instead of three cents. By the way, you know, you, you work in programmatic, so you know that you can make some money with three cents. You just have to, you know, have about nine billion ad calls a day, and then you can actually make some money. Yeah. No, no, they're not. But but let's not you know, let's not do math. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Here and then we and then we'll go to this woman back here. No? Oh, you have someone there? Sorry. Go ahead. All right. Hi, my name is Hendra Can okay, you stand up and uh, identify yourself? Hendra Suchaya with Kilana Technologies and Capital. Try to understand your visions. Uh, I believe, <laughs> Me too. <Yeah. laughs> I believe EU, uh, they, their belief system is that data belongs or owned by the individual and yeah. only an individual. Correct or not? Uh, I, I, well, now we're going to get into taxonomies of data. Okay. Yes, certain well, kinds of data is owned by the individual, yes. You believe that data should not be monopolized, but at the same time, the data should be sold and traded. Yes. And that the person who, the entity that accumulates the data should be compensated for their efforts to accumulate the data. Well, not just data accumulate, but actually refine, yes. So you, will, you believe data is commodity that should not be monopolized? Yes, not? but let's not forget it's non-rival risk, but let's keep going. So, but at the same time, data is commodities to be traded. Yes or no? Is it a commodity that can be traded? Yes. Can it be traded for uh, value, whether it's three cents, zero cents, or you know, three million cents? Not quite yes. sure. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, you are. Yes, yes so and yes. Do you have a bigger question about that? Or what, well, what I'm trying to understand the visions, because um, the, the question is always, um, to what extent would your own data, your personal data, should be shared, right? Yeah. You, are you- To the extent if, I agree to. OK then that means you have to put in place a control system of yes, your data that absolutely. you own. You must put so in place a control system, a security system, uh, an auditing system. You need, you need something that has uh, a trustless environment that lasts forever, that uh, can be verified, validated, and audited publicly. We solve that problem. How? It's called blockchain. It exists. Oh, but it's not implemented yeah. in any government system. And it doesn't system. even have to be called blockchain. We could call it something other. We probably should call it something else. <laughs> you know? But it's just databases and rules and technology and storage. It's not that complicated. No, We're understand. in our own way. I understand. But com uh, blockchain has its own problem in the sense that it could be appended without being, could be revised. Everything so can it, be hacked. So your data could be falsified yes. and then you have no way to We're fix it. We're going to have problems. When we started the original internet, and I say we royally because I sure as hell am not Al Gore. Um, <laughs> when, when it started, it was awesome, and it was fucking awesome. Like, bad things happened. It was scary, okay? We're humans. We're going to kill each other. We're going to do <laughs> stupid things. We're going to be fraudulent. We're, we're going to stalk each other. Uh, we're not going to solve that with blockchain, but we can make things better and more interesting and more innovative. That's what I think we should do. Okay, so we're kind of well, stuck. Okay, we got to we got to move on to some okay. other questions. So you really? both believe both. I of love this, that he's moderating. It is supposed uh, to be. <laughs> so you, okay, we, we really have straight. to move on to other. Your data is supposed to be controlled by you, but at the same time, it's allowed to be traded as a commodity. Yeah. You set you, you set you you can set how it's controlled. Yeah. It's up to yeah. you. Okay, up we got you. you here, and then we're gonna go this one back here. Mm -hmm. That's right. You can grab Hi, it. Hi, so Tristan oh, Lewis. Good, good. Uh, you and I have no. We go way back. Before. We go this way guy, back. Wait, this guy, this guy left like the first comment on my blog in 2003. Oh, that's <laughs> we're we're 1.0 people, <laughs> and and the thing is that. Well, one, say more. But who are you? Though? Well, so I, I'm a serial entrepreneur in the space. I've built magazines like you have. I've succeeded and failed at some of them. Like I have. Built startups. <laughs> we we've done uh, some a number of things together. Uh, this. The question that I have is, so we were wide-eyed idealists in 1.0, and we're like open world, et cetera. It moved to centralized controls of data, the Facebooks, Googles, et cetera, because consumers found it to be easy. And along the way, there's been a number of companies that have tried to right. get people to unlock their data and get value out of it. Yep. I invested in a few. Yeah. Why now? Light that on fire. Yeah, why, why, now, why is now the time for those kinds of interactions, for that model, 
well, the consumers would be able to do this in, I'm assuming, a relatively yeah. frictionless way. Why would yeah. it happen now as opposed right. to any other mm -hmm. time? That's a good question. Question. That's a really good question. Um, uh, you know, the, the, my, my answer to why now is, come on, guys, it's been 30 years. Let's get it together. Um, I, I think we're ready. I think uh, as a society, as, as, as Pete asked the, the first question, I think we have finally figured out this stuff matters. It changes elections. It uh, changes what price you pay for something. It changes whether you get a job. It changes what your insurance rates are. It changes so many things. If you read Weapons of Mass Destruction, which is a great kind of primer on all the things that, that it changes, these things are true. And uh, it's powerful. And I think people know that. And so the opportunity to do some enlightened policy work is upon us. I don't, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying it's the best moment yet. I've got one quick follow-up on this. the tech is super good There now. was this guy in the 2000 that ran this magazine called The Industry Standard. And I've never he, heard of it. <laughs> and he did, uh, he did research that showed that uh, at the time, 66% of users were willing to give up their social security number in exchange for free shipping. Yeah. Why, yeah. you know, yeah. why, why would that change now? I don't think it would. I, it just wasn't tokenized, securitized in a trustless environment that you could actually audit, right? Now it is. Fucking give me free shipping for I my see. social security number. <laughs> okay, we're gonna, you know, we gotta As long as I trust and, the and environment, can I see, can there'll be third parties other hands that, of people? Okay. that monitor and, that, by the way. Okay, well, no, but we're back here, uh, this one here. And Sorry. Then over, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Maddie. I work uh, in data governance technology at Amazon. Yay! <laughs> and, I'm uh, sorry, I really like Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's okay. And um, I'm about to be one of your students at SIPA. So, oh. looking forward to that. Oh, so am I. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm glad that we got to know each other this way. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about the node structure. Yeah. And, um, that technology doesn't exist today. The, the tokenization and the sharing, obviously, it's a vision. Somebody has to build it. Will that be a private company? How does that company avoid becoming, you know, the one biggest single accumulator of the most yeah. valuable data in the world? Right. And on the flip side, how could you possibly make it public? Right. Uh, what, make the company public? Right. How the, could you that not? That builds and owns the technology. How could you not is my question. Um, I'll take it backwards. Yeah. First. The company, a company, the companies, and I believe it will be an ecosystem of companies that builds uh, a node infrastructure, you know, for, uh, first of all, let's not do what Europe tends to do. When Google started gaining power in the early aughts, Europe got together and said, we're going to build a competitor. And they literally funded it with, I think, over a billion dollars and, and tried to build, like, it was a committee. They built a search engine by committee. Let's not do that. Let's not build the node network by committee. Let's let the market build it. But let's set the conditions for it to be built. That's first. Second to your question of should that one company may win or sort of be the Netscape for a while until Microsoft, you know, Microsoft's them um, and, and, and so on. Should, should, that company should be public. I think public companies should, are, are, they have a sacred duty to report and be transparent in the scientific method of transparency and sharing. We have allowed our public companies to become absolute laughing stocks in, the, in, in, in terms of what a public company sh truly should be. Mark Zuckerberg has complete control over Facebook. He has majority voting rights. The board is toothless. And I know and really like several members of that board. They have no power, none, zero. A true public company is run by a board. And that board has absolute fiduciary uh, and moral responsibility for the, the actions of that company. That public company should truly be public. That's why it's called public. It's a good word, public, except when it's used with restrooms often. But generally speaking, public is a good word. Um, so I think it should be. And, and, I, and I think that the technology uh, exists uh, to build this out. It just hasn't been built out, is, is what I have been told by people far smarter than me on these issues. I could be completely wrong. I mean, almost everything I said could be completely wrong. This is like version 0.9. So, but I'm Showing excited about it. Showing yourself short, you got a good argument there. Okay, we're <laughs> going to move here, and then, um, and then we'll go to you. Oh. Go ahead, will you stand up and identify yourself? Hi, I'm Judy Shapiro, CEO of Engage Simply. We're an ad tech firm. 
Um, if you were 1.0, I was pre. I was at Bell Labs then. Ooh. So we were building awesome. the stuff. Bell um, Labs. Yeah. Have you watched the uh, Marvelous Miss Maisel? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Bell yeah. Labs. Um, uh, uh, no. Um, <laughs> and so you made a really interesting point in the very beginning that I want to uh, uh, touch on. You said you're not seeing a lot of new ideas. In my opinion, what has happened is the VC model has truly corrupted a lot of what's going on. So you have a lot of companies that have been created that shouldn't have. When a VC says to me, scale, they don't mean it honorably. They don't. They don't care. No. It could be a million, it could be 10 million, as long as you scale. And so the toxicity that we're seeing, to me, data is a byproduct. Yeah. The killer application is advertising. I think we all can, can uh, agree mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. And so when you have misaligned interests, um, because you have VCs who want to scale, you have marketers who don't care. Um, Chase did another experiment. They got rid of, I don't know, 5,000 sites, no degradation of sales. Yeah. So a lot of the question for me is around VCs and what they are putting their money behind. What do you think about that? To all the VCs in the room, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you're here, I know there's a few of you. Um, I, hmm. Okay, I just took VC money for my seventh company. Um, I think you have to choose wisely. Um, and a, I am not 100% certain that the VCs are to blame, but I do think that if you hold them accountable to their model, the model is starting to get the speed wobbles. Um, we actually put more money, uh, VC money, into the US economy uh, this past year than, uh, than 1999, first time. Uh, so that is a, if the area, that's a red flag. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, a lot of this was very late stage, secondary yeah. stuff, you know, 10 million, 10 billion dollars into Uber to, you know, make a new crop of Uber millionaires. Um, but, but the truth is, uh, the models of VCs, is, uh, they're starting to break. Um, I go to an event every year that features about half VCs and half entrepreneurs. It's an awesome event. It's sort of become like an, you know, like an, an old alumni club because we go every year. And, um, and the moaning about how the, they, no one in the VC business can make any money, especially in the first, second, and third rounds, right? You know, sort of, you know, seed A, B. And the reason is, is because what you do is you just take, you know, 20, 30, 40, depending on the size of your fund, bets on stuff that hopefully works out, and you want one of them or two of them to be a Facebook or a Google or an Amazon or an Uber or an Airbnb, right? Those aren't happening so much anymore. They're all getting either snapped up at the 100 million or 200 million range. Gosh, that sounds terrible, but anyway. Um, or they're failing. And, and so that VC model, especially the beginning VC model, has really got some problems. And to me, uh, when I was talking to VCs about it, I said, you know, this sounds to me like there's an innovation crisis, right? Like new interesting companies can't really find their bliss. It takes 10 years, eight to 10 years of hard work to get a company to, you know, DocuSign, 14 years, like 11 years, I think. I don't know how long it took, but it took a long time. Like that capital at the early stages needs to believe there's an exit that isn't just selling out at the A or B round to the established players who've already won. What, what's heartbreaking, and it happens to many companies, is VCs are deliberately um, creating a set of ventures that are detached from client outcomes. And to me, a client outcome is a publisher, an advertiser, and the end user. Well, the VC should just sort of read a few interviews with Jeff Bezos. It's like always about the customer. Exact, exactly. <laughs> it's always about the customer. So one VC literally told me to my face, it was a deal, at the deal table, I walked away, and he said to me, Judy, you're just too invested in client outcomes. <laughs> the way we deal go. with those VCs is we don't take their money. Okay, okay, we're going uh, okay, to go here, and then we'll go to the way back there, too. Yeah, Hi, but stand Marcy. up and identify yourself. But some good, these are all good just, questions. Can you stand up? I'm good. No, I'm, I'm good. Well, we, we need it for the video. Can uh, we do it? Uh, <laughs> oh, Marcy. Um, um, I'm Marcy from WeWork, and it is, it's awesome to be here, John. Congratulations. This is, um, it's such a cool crowd. I've met so many interesting people already just, just here, but um, I want to reference my notes, which is, okay. which is why I'm sitting. Um, I, I know this is going to sound funny, but I don't think you're thinking big enough. Wow. 
I, I worked closely with Marcy for many years. <laughs> <laughs> and part of the reason is when, where I thought you were going when you were talking about enlightenment. Yeah. So you, you put up enlightenment and data, and it made me think of the, how, how they think of, how the Buddhists, how Buddhists think of enlightenment. Yeah. And, and enlightenment is, comes down to connecting you with purpose. Right. That's it. That's enlightenment. And I started to wonder about, I thought you were going to talk about data and its connection of purpose and mm. how so much of marketing has become terrible. I mean, it's, it's, become, it's become terrible. And the destruction that, that it's, uh, that's evolved. And, and simply solving for that is about connecting it to it, its purpose. Yeah. And I guess I'd, I'd wonder or even challenge you to think about whether as you're doing your visualization and your mapping of data, I would love personally as a marketer to be a part of a movement with other marketers to look at my, my, the impact of marketing and data on yeah. the planet. Yeah. And if you could visualize it, it may have more meaning. It may become more real. Yeah. And it may inspire people to make changes uh. because we're using consumer data to, to influence people to buy products and do things yes. that are ultimately super destructive yeah. to everything else around us. Uh, mm. Amen. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, as you well know, Marcy, the, the first, the, so the, the last company, Nuka, was all about this, right? And, and, and I don't, um, you know, even though the product was awesome, um, and we did 30 cities, you know, over four years uh, of this innovation festival we did, um, it was a terrible business, but a great product. Um, I'm all about, like, to me, you know, companies that have a purpose are companies that are, have a much higher chance of sticking around. Um, marketers that have identified their purpose are marketers that have a much greater chance of having converted long-term high value engagements with customers. Like that, I just think that's just true. And I think a movement towards that, it's ripe. There's so many people I've talked to that are saying what you're saying. Um, so I'm gonna keep that well in mind because this visualization is in fact a visualization of the advertising ecosystem. Right, that's what we're most focused on. We're hoping to take that after, you know, if I can, if I can keep my job, we're hoping to uh, uh, take that and move it into other markets. But we're starting with marketing advertising for this reason. It is where the most messaging hits the most people, and the most money moves with that intent. Right? We're going to get into healthcare. We're going to go into agra, you know, ag. Uh, we're going to go into energy, into finance. There's so many places where this same architecture of control of data is starting to take over or has completely colonized, right? But we want to, the prototype is here in advertising and marketing. So thank you for that. I'm going to keep that well in mind. Think bigger. That's, I love that. Okay, we got in the way back there. Oh, here it is. Hello, uh, last one for me. I'm from Tabulum Night. Quick question. Um, when we talk about data in Europe and data in the US, we talk about Patriot Act. The Patriot Act. Yes, what, what do you think about that? I don't like the Patriot Act. <laughs> um, I didn't like it when it was passed. Um, uh, 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 for those of you who don't know, I will not be able to do a proper potted history of the Patriot Act, but in essence, it was a, a response to uh, the terrorism that um, gave new and sweeping powers to the government. The thing that I li liked least about it was the, it denied the right to know. Um, uh, if you uh, or your information were subject of a search um, uh, and that firm uh, had that information or that data about you, um, uh, then the government could uh, subpoena that data uh, through a, a warrant, uh, through a secret court. Um, and not only were you, if you were the subject of that search or your information was the subject of that search, not only do you uh, not know about it, uh, the law requires companies to not tell you about it. Um, and that's just bullshit. <laughs> that's just straight up American bullshit. Um, I don't like that law. I don't think it was well written. I think a lot of people who wish they had that for many decades used an opportunity to get it through. The left field bleachers here. <laughs> now you know my politics. We've had such a big crowd here. I just want to make sure. Was there anyone over here Le that wanted to Left field questions? bleachers. Okay, there we go. Why don't we, why don't we go there? <laughs> This is like, we've literally expanded the ballpark for John's uh, oh, this talk is here. Oh, so awesome. Yeah. Okay, I'm told him to stand. Thank you for a really compelling address. Um, I'd encourage you, though, if, again, with this notion of uh, giving people 
uh, a place, individuals in a place and nodes in a place in this uh, value chain uh, to take a look at uh, the work of Fred Block and Mariano Mazzucato, who've actually, it, it would address some of the, um, what you've described as the problem with VCs and sort of their place in this ecosystem. Because mm -hmm. what it actually documents quite rigorously is the degree to which the people actually responsible for innovation are all of us. That in fact, the great source of value in innovation in America for the last uh, 60, 100 years is uh, actually is, is the government. Developing GPS, developing innovation, uh, you know, and, and funding, you know, yeah. development of the algorithms. And so, in fact, um, and in fact, the problem now might be in terms of the, what you've described as the absence of innovation is because the rhetoric about where value actually is generated is so distorted away from the true, true source yeah. of that innovation yeah. It, it, that in fact money is actually being extracted from where it should go, which is in in um, you know seeding at when things are still inexpensive, the generators of low level you know kinds of experiments right. that once successful can then be infused with more funding and instead are are it's you know the structures are putting bigger bets on greater risks that in, in fact don't work out very a, right. as frequently. So right. anyway, just a suggestion. Uh, I, I look forward to reading that. Thank you. She's, uh, we, we just as a little point of reference, actually, we had Mariana Mazzucato in San Francisco in San, uh, September in her new book, um, The Value of Everything. And so yes, which is on my desk, but I haven't read it. If anyone now. wants to watch uh, it, now I will. her presentation, which is awesome, um, you, it's also off the site here. Um, OK, so we have this woman here. And then uh, other, any last few ones? Oh, yes, right here. We have last couple questions. And then I think uh, we have more food, drink, and let people Connect. There's so many awesome folks here. Let's reconnect with everybody else. Thank you, you for your talk. I've no, been following sure. you for a while through NUCO, so I'm thrilled that you moved to New York, by the way. Big fan Me too. Of New York, the West, East yeah. Coast. Um, I have you, a question. Could you identify yourself? Sure. Those? My name is Annalena Pedigo. My company is The Show Goes On Productions. I work primarily with artists. And uh, my question for you is, have you thought at all about where AI is going to take the future of data and mm. really who owns data that AI creates? Well, I, I had an answer for you to that last part. Um, uh, I'll start with the first and try to get to that. Um, yes, first of all, um, almost all AI is Boolean operators. It ain't freaking complicated. It's just a set of rules and parameters that runs, you know, it's reason that we lay out to route information flows. But it can grow itself, right? And then it gets complicated. Um, but, but at the end of the day, we're, 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 uh, generalized AI is still a, a ways off. Um, we need to prepare for that, but that's a whole other conversation, which I'm sure you've already had several on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to, as, to, as to who owns the data that AI creates, it's an interesting question. It kind of echoes Michael's question in a way. Um, I think it depends on who's involved in, 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 in the creation of the AI, who's involved in the value exchange with the AI. Um, and whether or not society has a, a role. You know, we, we, look, the greatest AI we've ever created is money, in my opinion. Um, you know, money has its own velocity. Uh, it's a complete fiction, um, but we just keep making more of it. Uh, and who owns money, right? You know, that's a big question, especially for like the students from, you know, City College, right? Um, we need to rethink the rules of who owns money and how money runs around, and I think we need to do it pretty quickly. And I think we also have to think very deeply about who uh, has a societal stake in AI. What's nice to see is how many people who have real credibility in the space raising their hand, you know, Reid Hoffman or Elon Musk or Jessica Livingston or, you know, um, Kai yeah, Kai Fu Lee or the late, you know, the late uh, great Stephen uh, uh, Hawking or, you know, there's a lot of people who are like Bill Gates, like saying, guys, we have a conversation we need to have and many of them putting hundreds of millions of dollars behind it to make sure that conversation happens, so. Which also happened maybe to a smaller extent at the beginning of Facebook, no? 
Oh, we can go down there. Right. Oh, boy. Um, okay. I, I will say, actually, the thing about the AI is interesting is I thought you hadn't brought it up, and thanks for bringing that up, because it seems to me AI is essentially a function of just big data and kind of being able to get access to insane amounts of data oh. and do things that humans couldn't have done. So it feels like another piece of the urgency of why now we have to figure this out is we are on the cusp of an experiment explosion of the exploitation well, AI, of yeah. ev all this data. AI is, is one of the digital sense-making organs yeah, that exactly. I referred to yeah. before. It, yeah. it is our way of understanding and mining understanding uh, from this explosion, this renaissance of data that we're in the midst of. Yeah, yeah. and we got to figure that out. Yeah. Okay, well, this woman here, and then I think uh, we'll, we'll wrap it. Go ahead. Um, my name is... Could you stand up and sure. just yeah, introduce, introduce yourself? Hi. Oh, hey. Hey, um, my name is Patricia Daly, and I'm a professor of literature and philosophy at Columbia, so I really have am from a completely different world. But I wanted to follow what you were saying a little bit in a different direction, trying to yoke this back to questions of social justice, and think of ways one could possibly do that rather than just thinking about monetization and, uh, and profit. For example, you've already pointed out that uh, yoking it back to the individual and the individual's value already represents a small return in terms yeah. of sense. And potentially that would just repeat itself and be the same thing. Mm. Um, so how do you change that? And I was thinking, well, wouldn't one way be if you have, I mean, you might end up with third parties who yet again yeah. collect all that data in yeah. the name of that people just let these larger brokers mm -hmm. then yes. run with that. But what if you then have these other groups or formations that people could voluntarily yes. give their data to that say, hey, we're only going to work with these companies that then put a certain amount back into the right. community or have a certain amount of social responsibility. Absolutely. So what about that kind of a larger yeah. picture that would actually shift this whole vision in a slightly different way? Well, I, I, um, first of all, you know, great question. Uh, but but also, in, you know, again, I do this talk, and now I know I need to add a slide on that. Um, but this isn't just uh, capitalistic, right? This isn't just about value exchange in terms of currency. But if you define currency as any value exchange and not just dollars or monetary, right? There's so much value exchange to be made. Again, this data is non-rivalrous, so you can give it to as many people as you want, number one. Secondly, the ability to control and manage settings and revoke those settings. Right? If you give that token to Walmart and they start acting like yahoos, turn it off. Right? If you, you know, but you can give data to whoever you wish to give it to. And if it's easy, if it's frictionless, you can start to, I mean, the, the, the impact on research alone. Here's one example, and I wouldn't say it's necessarily a perfect one, but it might be uh, anecdotally sort of in the right direction. Uh, 23andMe. Uh, uh, ancestry, but really 23andMe. Um, they have all, all, all my data, uh, or at least as much as you know when I spit in the cup, right? Um, and they do ask me if I will give that data anonymously to a large data project that is cross industry to do medical research, right? And I'm like, yeah. Well, what kind of a Asshole would I be if I didn't do that, right? You know, I want to do that, you know, because I I is it possible that, that my little data might help something else? Awesome. I think that there's this idea um, that all data is somehow driven by monetization, but I think you're right. We have to think much more broadly about it, and we have to imagine a world where, um, you know, the, 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 the value of what can be known is a value in and of itself, right? I mean, that's one of the reasons I, I'm attached to Columbia, is because I don't have to talk about companies all day. I, I, I can just talk about ideas, and that, there's value in just doing that, right? And so I think we can support that with this economy, and, and, and we have an economy of ideas as much as we have an economy of dollars, right? And so I, I'm, I, we should talk more about it, because I, I want to work it into the work. And we can do that. Um right now when we're going to have drinks and food here. And I know there's still other hands, and you can come up and talk to John here for a little bit. But let's give John an amazing Thank you. thanks. Okay? Got us all thinking big. Got us all thinking, uh, thinking big. Right so on. that's all good. So thanks right again. And do stay and do meet folks here. And uh, come back to future ones. Thank you. <laughs>